DNA protein interactions. Once the DNA structure was proposed by Watson and Crick, that led to n number of studies with respect to the structure of the DNA and uh, having found out that there is different type of base pairing possible, that there are different forms of DNA that can uh, be seen uh, in vivo as well as in vitro. Uh, one another interesting facet that has been studied and is being studied and over a period of time a lot has been understood and yet a lot still needs to be understood and that is with the respect to the dynamics of the interaction of the DNA and the protein. So this session is only going to look at a basic understanding of how DNA protein interactions happen. So let us look at the learning outcomes of the session. Uh, so almost all biological processes, you know, whether it is transcription, whether it is replication, whether it is uh, uh, control of gene regulation, whether it is genome editing, uh, be it any molecular mechanistic, you know, uh, at the primary level or at the grassroots level, uh, it is the ultimate working of the cell is ultimately dependent on DNA protein interactions and uh, hence uh, this DNA protein interaction could either be sequence specific or it could be not sequence specific. The interaction can be specific but it is not dependent on the sequence per se. So uh, the sequences in either the DNA or in the protein. So when you're looking at sequences in DNA, you're liquid looking at the nucleotide sequence and when you're looking at the proteins, you're obviously looking at the amino acid residues or the amino acid sequence in the proteins and the shape of either the protein or the DNA. So we are looking basically at the 3D structure of these macromolecules and both of these play a very important role in the recognition process. Now, when you have amino acids of the protein directly interacting with the base pairs, then it is considered to be what is called as the direct readout method. Now it is more accepted as what is called as base readout. And uh, while it is, if it is an indirect contact, so if the uh, amino acid residues of the protein are interacting either through water molecules or they are basically interacting with the conformation, the shape of the uh, DNA, then that is what is understood to be indirect readout. But it is, it, is, it is eventually the base sequence that is leading to the conformational change as well. So one cannot really say an indirect readout. This is more understood or accepted as what is called as the shape readout now. So there are specific DNA binding motifs present in the DNA binding proteins that enable binding to specific sequences or specific shapes in the DNA. So uh, we would one by one look at various aspects related to these DNA protein interactions. So let us first look at the non-specific interactions that occur between the DNA and the, um, uh, you know, uh, yes. So uh, let us look at how the DNA and the protein interact. But now these interactions are what are the non-specific interactions. So the understanding therefore is that be it anywhere in the DNA, irrespective of what the nucleotide sequence is, the protein should be able to bind to the DNA. That is what we mean by non-specific interactions. So, say for example, you have a histone core. So, we all know that whenever you look at DNA, DNA is never really present as a naked DNA, but it is always associated with proteins that to histone proteins to, to exist in chromatin form. So, when you're looking at the formation of the chromatin, it is always that the histone will go and bind or the DNA is going to wrap around a histone and thereby you have the DNA getting more condensed. So the question over here is, or the basic observation here is, that the histones can definitely bind to certain sequences with greater affinity, but it is not that they cannot bind to uh, sequences that with which it does not have too high an affinity to bind to. So therefore, here we can kind of point out that the binding of histone to the DNA is not sequence specific. 
okay so what is therefore deciding that the histone can bind to the pro uh, sorry the uh, uh, histone as a protein can bind to the dna so it is clearly observed that generally these interactions of the histones with respect to the dna are through the major grooves or the minor grooves so the amino acid residues in the proteins are able to interact with the uh, functional groups of the nucleobases that are present in the major and the minor group so you have a micro environment here in the major group you have a micro environment here in the minor group and that micro environment is conducive for interaction between the protein and the dna now what kind of interactions generally are observed so you can have hydrogen bonding between the sugar phosphate backbone and the amides of the protein you can have electrostatic interactions so salt bridges can be formed between the negatively charged dna and the positively charged histone tails so we know that histone tails have lysines arginines and these lysine arginines are basic amino acid so they will have a net positive charge on the uh, histone tail because of the presence of these basic amino acids and of course the dna with the sugar phosphate backbone has a net negative charge so the interaction of the negative and the positive charges leads to physical forces coming together to form an interaction so those are what we understand by electrostatic interactions also one could have non polar interactions so you may have the nucleobases or uh, sorry you may have the amino acid residues interacting with the sugar of the nucleobases or you may have a methylated region of the nucleobase which can interact with a certain amino acid residue so then that interaction becomes a non polar interaction so you can very clearly observe that it is not one type of interaction there are basically a cumulative binding or cumulative interactions that finally help the protein to interact with the dna in a non specific manner so it is mainly looking at the fact that you can have hydrogen bonding possible or you can have electrostatic interactions possible or you can have non polar interactions possible irrespective of what the sequence of base pairs is in the dna or irrespective of what the amino acid residue sequences there in the proteins so that is basic some basically something that looks at non specific interactions another example for non specific interaction is we all know that single strand binding protein would come and bind to any single strand that has formed so during replication when are the origins of replication the dna unwinds it unwinds into two single strands and the moment the two single strands are formed the single strand binding protein cooperatively come and bind to the single strands to stabilize the system same is observed when one looks at transcription so during transcription when the dna opens up again you would uh, uh, sorry uh, during dna repair mechanism is again where a particular region when the dna opens up you will have single stranded binding protein coming and stabilizing the single strands that have been formed so this is something that is observed and the single stranded binding protein can go and bind to anywhere in the dna where the dna has become single stranded so therefore that is basically trying to say that the interaction of the single stranded binding protein with the dna is not based on a sequence specific interaction it is more as in presence of the single strand okay so therefore it is not looking at the sequence but it is only looking at whether there is a single strand or not so the single stranded binding protein has certain structural super secondary uh, so super secondary structures which we call as motifs and that is what is called as the ob fold now the o can stand for oligosaccharide binding or it can also stand for oligonucleotide binding so when you are looking at uh interaction of dna with the protein then you are looking at the ob fold as an oligonucleotide binding fold but say when you have a protein interacting with protein then one can one can have the protein ob fold binding to the oligosaccharide components in a protein in another protein so that is also possible now interestingly is this ob fold has five uh beta sheets and you can see how it is forming a barrel the five beta sheets form a barrel and there is one alpha helix so it is a super secondary structure 
and this super secondary structure is able to bind to the single stranded dna so this interaction basically is something that is non specific interaction so what kind of interactions are possible so like we mentioned earlier you can have hydrogen bonding you can have hydrophobic regions binding to the nucleobases so you can have portions of the uh, you know ob fold stacking between the base pairs and the single strand and you can have electrostatic interactions through salt bridges as well so this is how non specific interactions happen now let us go to specific interaction so there are two major categories uh, with respect to specific dna by, uh, dna protein interaction and those two major categories is uh, one of the categories is what is called as base readout so the protein is actually reading the sequence of base pairs in the dna or reading the sequence of base is nucleobases in one strand but it is generally a base pair that is read so the base readout again can be divided into two subcategories one that is read out through the major, major groove and one that is read out through the minor groove the other category is what is called as shape readout okay so shape readout also is further divided so this is basically looking at the conformation of the dna the shape of the dna so this is again divided into two subcategories one is what is called as a global shape recognition and the other one is what is called as a local shape recognition so when uh, when you look at global shape recognition you are looking at whether the entire dna is bent okay or when you looking at local shape recognition you are saying that if in the entire dna only at one position there is a bent okay then that is what is called as a local shape recognition so basically in both these conditions you are looking at what kind of conformation or what kind of shape the dna basically has a single dna binding protein may use both that means it can use base readout as well as it can read uh, as as well as through shape readout it can establish the dna binding specificity so slowly and gradually what has been observed with a lot of studies that now you cannot really demarcate dna binding uh, with only base readout or with only shape readout it is always a combination of base readout and shape readout with which the protein dna interaction is associated most dna binding proteins okay interestingly belong to very large families that share certain dna binding domains and all these dna binding domains will have very similar biochemical properties and most regulatory proteins okay the ones that are actually you know for example transcription factors for example activators for example repressors those that are actually controlling expression of gene or those that are actually controlling a molecular mechanistic they are highly specific in their interaction and most regulatory proteins are interacting with the dna and the specificity increases when there is both base readout and shape readout so you may you may kind of say that there is a very thin line of difference or a thin line of you know differentiating between just reading by base readout or just reading by shape readout so the 3d structures of both the proteins and the dna contribute to the specific interaction so it's not only a one way uh, interaction it has to be a two way interaction so both the protein and the dna contribute to that specific interaction we now initially these readouts were called as direct and indirect readouts but now it has been accepted more as direct being the base readout and indirect being the uh, shape readout so when you look at uh, the base readout one is definitely looking only at the dna sequence so we understand that that is a chemical signature so we are saying chemical signature because it is a t g c so they are the, they are the uh, they are the molecules that interact so they are chemical structures okay so therefore uh it is looking at the chemical signature and definitively what has been observed in most dna binding protein interaction it is the major groove that plays a very important role notwithstanding that there can be interactions through minor groove as well okay but whether it is major groove or whether it is minor groove what is important is 
that there is always a set of nucleobase specific hydrogen bond donors or acceptors or non-polar groups that ultimately are recognized by a complementary set of donors and acceptors present in the protein. So, the amino acid residues should be able to accept and donate uh, protons or should be having a non-polar uh, constituent which can inter interact with a non-polar constituent of the nucleobase. So, this, this, this complementarity between the protein and the DNA is important. The other one which we are looking at as indirect readout or more accepted today as a shape readout depends on the DNA structure. So, what is the shape and because of the shape, what is the microenvironment associated with that shape? So, for example, base pairs themselves can create or facilitate a specific DNA structure. And that structure is subsequently recognized by a protein. So, for example, we know that DNA can deviate from B DNA to either A DNA or Z DNA depending on uh, either the base pairs or depending on the exogenous environment. So, if it deviates say from B DNA to Z DNA, then that becomes a confirmation which is different from the normal B DNA and those Z DNA or A DNA regions may be recognized by certain proteins. So, what is the protein looking at? The protein is looking at the confirmation of the DNA. So, ultimately what is understood and what has been, you know, uh, said every by from every study what is very clear is that for a specific interaction both are needed that is base reader out is also needed and shape readout is also needed now let us look at the dna sequence and the dna structure so interesting to note is that it is the dna sequence that can decide what kind of a structure the dna can have so there is an evident correlation, therefore, between the DNA sequ sequence and the structure that is adopted by the DNA. So, for example, we very clearly know that if there is alternate GC base pairing, then that can lead to the formation of the Z DNA. And in a single DNA, a certain portion of the DNA can be B DNA, and then there is a junction, and immediately after that, there can be a Z DNA. So, you can see that within one single DNA itself, you can have the B DNA as well as the Z DNA. And therefore, there is a change in conformity just around the junction. And it may so happen that it is this conformation change or deviation that can be the site for the protein to come and interact. And whenever you have conformational changes, so for example, if B DNA goes to Z DNA, you will find that the minor groove, major groove dimensions change. And also, therefore, because the dimensions change, the mi minor groove, major groove environment changes. And when the environment changes, obviously, interactions can change. Secondly, because there is a difference in the shape itself, okay, so we, we kind of know that a certain shape fits into another shape. So, the shape itself can basically be the response for a DNA binding to the DNA, uh, sorry, DNA binding to a protein. Again, interesting to notice that because of the DNA sequence and the structure adopted, which you may call as deformities, you know, when we call deformities, it is basically deviating from the normal. So, if deformities are possible, then along with these deformities is, will be associated what is called as deformities energy. So, there will be different kinds of energy associated and those energies associated can basically lead to a more thermo thermodynamic favorable interaction or a more or a less thermodynamic favorable interaction deciding whether it is specific interaction or a non-specific interaction. Now, how does these deformities affect? So, you can have a different electronic cloud around a base pair or so, for example, if it's Watson and Crick base pair, then the electronic configuration can be different. If it is Hookstein base pairing, then the electronic configuration can be different. If it is Wobbles base pairing, then the electronic configuration can be different. So, you can see how the different base pairs itself can decide the electronic cloud around it and that in turn can affect with what it can interact. 
Also, therefore, the number of hydrogen bonds that can be formed can vary. And of course, like already mentioned, what is the environment in the minor and the major groove is something that is definitely a deciding factor. So the sequence, the DNA sequence can also, this is another interesting observation, can decide the persistence length. So this term persistence length is basically referring to the DNA stiffness. Okay, so a certain type of sequence can make the DNA structure more stiff or less stiff. Lots of studies that have been carried out point out to, and of course one should always look at the fact that one is looking at a more general observation, but with certain specifics you may have the observation differing. But a general observation by studying several DNA protein interactions it has been found that if you have an AT rich region, that means if the sequence is AT rich, then the DNA of the AT rich sequence is found to be more bendable. So, at that point, the persistent length is low, and because the persistent length is low, you will have bending of the DNA happening. Please do understand that the bend itself could be rigid, but the bend is possible because of the sequence being AT rich. Now, therefore, it is when you look at the GC rich region, it is found that the persistent, uh, persistent length is high. And because the persistent length is high, the stiffness is, uh, you know, more uh, or what you called as it is more stiff in terms of the fact that it may not bend. Okay. So, this AT rich region is considered to be more bendable in comparison to a GC rich region. But exceptions are always there. So we talked about the ZDNA and the BDNA. So you can see over here that in the single DNA itself, okay, you have just this being the junction. And at this junction, you can see that you have one base stacking that has got affected. And after that, this portion is the ZDNA and this portion is the BDNA. It could be attributed to the fact that these base pairing are GC base pairing and therefore the GC base pairing leads to the formation of the ZDNA over here. While these are base pairs which can form canonical Watson and Crick base pairs and therefore this, this area is BDNA. So within this DNA itself, you would have, look at the fact that this portion as ZDNA and this portion as BDNA. And the ZDNA may not be a permanent feature. It has occurred temporarily. It has occurred temporarily, say, because of high salt concentration or, say, because of some other environmental features. Now, this said DNA can become a site to which certain proteins can come and interact. You can also see that the BDNA over here, which was originally BDNA, can become ZDNA because of a change in the outer environment because of a change in the uh, environment that is present and so a BDNA form can get converted into a ZDNA form and now this is something that is recognized by a set of proteins. So that also is possible. So what has been often observed is that when you have GC repeats, they are hotspots of instability. Okay. Wherever you have ZDNA, those regions are considered to be definitely thermodynamically less stable than the BDNA itself. So they are observed probably to be more of temporary structures or formed because or they are there, but they are there for a certain reason. So in vitro Z conformations of DNA have been found in regions of supercoiled BDNA near the promoter regions. So this is interesting. So we all know that when transcription has to take place, just upstream of the gene is present the promoter region and it is at the promoter region that the DNA opens up. So for opening up of the DNA, if you have sequences of base pair which can be easily pried open, then there are greater chances of transcription happening. So if you have a closed complex, but if the closed complex is more favorable to going to open complex, then you know that you could have transcription getting stimulated. So, many a promoter region has been found to have Z confirmations because at that region you need the DNA to open up. So, 
there are several proteins that have reported to specifically bind to the ZDNA. So, interaction of this conformation with the protein is something that has been observed. And so, you can understand that the DNA structure adopted because of the GC base pairing has led to the protein interacting with it. So, in turn, we are basically looking at DNA sequence deciding the DNA structure and both the sequence and the structure, therefore, become the sites where the protein can come and bind to. Going forward in the same, with the same, uh, you know, understanding, let us look at the fact that there is another thing that influences structure and that is base stacking. What do we mean by base stacking? So, for example, this is the strand when you have an A over here and just below that C. So, the base stacking of these two would be different than if it is C and A or if it is A and A, okay, or if it is C and C, you know. So, what is the adjacent basis that would decide the way the base stacking is? So, it has been very clearly observed by various studies carried out that when you have a purin pyrimidin, when you have a purin pyrimidin base pair stacking, so base pair step, then the stacking area is wide or more and therefore this kind of stacking is more thermodynamically stable. But when you go, when you go to pyrimidine pyrimidine or purine purine or even pyrimidine purine, so in fact pyrimidine purine stacking is the least favorable because its stacking area is less. So this would be thermodynamically least stable. And so when you have a pyrimidine purine base step, then it is possible that because it is thermodynamically least stable, you can have a kind of movement or you can have a kind of change in conformation at this point. But this being more stable, the change in the conformity may be less. So stacking area can influence the persistence length. And we know that persistence length is a criteria to decide the uh, you know, structure of the DNA. So therefore, the flexibility or the rigidity would depend could also be dependent on not just the persistence length but also the stacking area. And both the persistence length and the stacking area are influenced by what? The sequence of the DNA. Now, there are lots of other higher order structures which are not very common also observed. So, uh, bending of the DNA is a higher order structure. As mentioned to you earlier, when you find an AT-rich region, you will find that the DNA at the AT-rich regions are more bendable. Now, therefore, the rigidity, okay, please do understand that although the DNA bends, so you can see that the helical axis is completely bending, okay. So, the rigidity of the strands is increasing. So, as a bend structure, it is rigid. But uh, that it bends itself is depending on the fact that it is an AT rich region and such AT rich regions are also called as A tracts. And interestingly, what has been observed with A tracts is that the A tracts, you would find uh, the base pairs having propeller twists, being buckled. You would have also find that the helical repeat is reduced. So, instead of 10.5 base pairs per turn, you could observe 10 base pairs per turn. So, there is a reduction in the number of base pairs per turn. So, you can see that the helical turn itself has changed in its, uh, you know, width uh, length. You can have a narrower minor groove. So, when you compare this minor groove with this minor groove, you can see that this is narrower than this. So, this popular twisting or uh, buckled base pairs or reduced helical repeat, they can all lead to forming narrower minor grooves. And this narrower minor groove can influence interaction because the micro environment over here would have changed accordingly. So therefore, the major grooves may also be such that there can be a several non-canonical Watson and Crick base pairing. So that can also influence interaction. One another phenomenon that is associated with, you know, bent DNA is that there is a zero net roll angle. Now, generally, our understanding of a, a double helical B DNA structure is that you have a net roll angle. So, when you have one base pair rolling by, say, 60 degrees, the other base pair will roll minus 60 degrees and therefore the two rolls angles will cancel out. But you see per base pair, there is a roll angle. So, to, to remain as a straight DNA, you would find that 
the base pairs are rolling but in case of the bent dna the roll angle is not changing it is remaining as zero so therefore you can see what we understand by rigidity so here you can see that there is a kind of rigidity observed and because of the rigidity you have the helical axis you know bent so the roll angle not being cancelled out the helical axis actually turns okay so this is something that is very interesting and uh, it has been observed with most bent structures so you have increased stiffness and interestingly wherever you have increased stiffness you can have the dna not being able to wrap around his stones so the condensation or the dna uh, condensation at at regions where there is a bent dna would be less their interaction with his stones will be less so those regions will be op open chromatin regions okay and thereby it it becomes accessible to other proteins to come and bind so therefore there can be a regulation happening because of another protein coming and binding to this bent dna region so you can see there are so many angles associated with sequence or tertiary structures of the dna you can also have what is called as a kink and you see the kink and the bend is slightly different so for example if you look at this helical axis you know that it will go straight like this if you look at this helical axis you will know that it goes straight like this so it's only at one point that the helical axis turns or the orientation of the helical axis is changing so that could be because of one base pair getting unstuck or one base pair going from you know a normal canonical watson and crick base pairing to a hookstein base pairing or it may also be that you know you can have the base pair having a propeller twist or it becoming buckled or it becoming tilted more all these can contribute to formation of a kink but see this change in structure is very local so the bend is only here you do not have a bend which is you know global so such structures are called as local structures or local conformational changes whereas the bend was bending of the dna was a global structural change uh interesting to note is that you know the kinks are generally formed uh when you have a lower stacking energy and we know that lower stacking energy is associated with the base pairing of pyrimidine purine uh base pair step of pyrimidine purine which has the least stack stacking area so any configuration or any base pair step which has least stack area and therefore lowest stacking energy that portion could be more flexible compared to a region where the stacking is more stable so it has been found that many of the kinks are associated with such pyrimidine purine uh, base pair step epigenetic dna modifications also contribute to higher order structures so what do we mean by epigenetic dna we mean by this we mean that the sequence does not change but one of the nucleotides or one of the bases can be modified so say for example cytosine is methylated at the fifth position then it is what is called as 5 methyl cytosine normally cytosine does not have a methyl group at the fifth position but if it gets methylated at the fifth position then it means that the cytosine is now modified so because it is modified it is an epigenetic change so cytosine remains cytosine the sequence is not changing but the cytosine is now in a different form it is as 5 methyl cytosine and so that becomes an epigenetic change but look at that fact that because you have a methyl group bound to the cytosine now this methyl group is contributing to non polar interactions because methyl groups themselves are hydrophobic or non polar and so it can uh you know contribute to forming a non polar interaction with an amino acid residue in a protein so therefore by just the epigenetic change again the interaction between the protein and the dna can alter moreover it has been associated to increase the rigidity and therefore also affect the bendability so you can see wherever there is a 5 methyl uh, cytosine you can see that the dna at that position kind of bends so the helical axis is bending uh so what we understand by here is that because of the methyl group the interactions that are happening can change because 
you have uh, now a non-polar group present in a in a region where that group was not present earlier. So the charge distribution and the steric properties in the major groove can get altered. So this 5-methylcytosin is something that has been observed with respect to histone DNA interaction. Wherever you have 5-methylcytosin, the chromatin is more open. That means less condensed because histone interaction with the DNA is decreasing because of the presence of the 5-methylcytosin. So these are some interesting facets. So methylated DNA Many of the regions where the DNA is methylated, the gene expression is understood to be affected. What you see over here is a typical holiday junction. So uh, the holiday junction formation can also be sequence dependent. So at specific sequences of the DNA, you can have a strand exchange happening. So you can see that there are two duplexes, but by between the two duplexes, you have the four strands forming a kind of branch point or what is called as the holiday junction and uh, interestingly many of these junctions are stabilized by the presence of divalent ions like magnesium and holiday junction is you know uh, what is referred to as the cruciform structures in DNA other than this higher order structure so again you can understand that this holiday junction itself can be a site for a protein to interact. This is a very special structure. And so to this special structure, you can have specific proteins coming and interact. Then you also have what is called as a quadruplex structure in the DNA. This is again a higher order structure. And it is also referred to as G4 structures. The reason for calling it as G4 structures is because it is a structure that is formed because of a repeat of guanine. Okay, it is highly rich in guanine. So these guanin residues have been observed to be on nucleo basis have been observed to be in Hookstein base pairing and we all know that whenever there is a Hookstein base pairing the characteristic of the double helix is going to change a lot a little with the minor groove uh, environment changing with the helix be becoming more constricted and all these changes are associated whenever you have Hookstein base pairing so you can see how at the quadruplex region you have a different microenvironment and that microenvironment can influence proteins to come and bind. So they form what is called as tetrads. So like here, even here, the structure is between four DNA C strands. Okay, so it forms what is called, called a tetrad. And again, over here also, uh, divalent ions uh, seem to play a very important role in stabilizing the structure. And there are very specific proteins that are known to bind to these G4 structures. So associated with the DNA protein interactions is of course thermodynamics. We will not be going into details of thermodynamics because that in itself is a very highly dynamic system because you know any kind of interaction that is aided by more than one type of bonding has a lot of uh, nuances that contribute to the final thermodynamics. But we just will try to understand a little on the binding th thermodynamics. So we all know that when you refer to thermodynamics, you're referring to the equation of delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. So G over here standing for uh, Gibbs free energy, H standing for enthalpy, T standing for temperature and S standing for entropy. So if there is a change in uh, enthalpy, there's going to be a change in free energy. If there is a change in entropy, there is going to be a change in free energy. If the entropy increases, then the delta G will become more negative. And when delta G becomes more negative, then it is considered to be giving rise to a spontaneous reaction. So that becomes a more favorable condition. So when delta G is negative, it is moving towards a more thermodynamically favorable condition. So therefore, understandably, the enthalpy as well as the entropy will contribute to the final free energy and that free energy decides how specific or what kind of interaction is possible between a DNA and a protein. So say for, for example in the double stranded DNA this is the region where there is a specific sequence. So to this specific sequence say a DNA comes and uh, sorry a protein comes and binds and the amino acid residues over here very specifically interact with the uh, base pairs in the DNA. So here the interaction is very specific, but 
the surrounding base pairs, the interaction with the protein is non-specific. So, at these regions, the binding affinity is going to be different. But at this region, the binding affinity is going to be very different. So, here the binding affinity will be sequence specific and therefore very high. But again, please note that this interaction has to be reversible. If a protein comes and binds and binds to the DNA permanently, then you will not have the DNA functioning the way it should. So, the dynamism of the DNA will be become less. And so, a protein's interaction with the DNA is always a reversible, mostly a reversible, uh, um, you know, um, interaction. So, the binding affinity, therefore, should be high, but not that high that it cannot be reversible. This is something that is evident. So, you need a delta G which is moving towards negative. But again, the delta G negative should be such that it can go, depending on the change in the delta H and the delta S, move towards a reversible condition. What contributes to the free energy? But obvious, it is the DNA conformation, the base stacking, the hydrogen bonding, the nonpolar interactions, all of these interactions will contribute to the free energy change. Now, say for example, you have the Tata binding protein. We all know that uh, many promoter regions, especially in the pro pro uh, in the prokaryotes, has what is called as a Pribnow box or a Tata box. And this Tata box is rich in AT base pairs. So, it is an AT rich region. So, when the Tata box binding protein comes and binds to the Tata box, okay, it has been observed to lead to unstacking of six bases. And that is why at the Tata box region, you can have the DNA opening up because there is a change happening due to the interaction with the Tata box binding protein. And this interaction and the unstacking of six bases requires about 50 to 60 kilocalories per mole. So therefore, it is at a cost of energy that you can have unstacking of six bases. Will that influence the delta G? Of course, it is going to influence the delta G. So this is just giving you an example of how when interacting, you can have thermodynamic changes. So, there has to be a sort of balancing of enthalpy and entropy changes. And based on those changes, you would have, you know, specific interactions possible. Looking at base readout a little more, okay. So, suppose you have the major groove, okay. And in the major groove, you have the nuclear bases A, C, G and T. Then, because the groove dimension is greater, okay, you can have the nucleobases uh, functional groups that are exposed more. So, you can have the adenine 6NH2 and 7N available for interaction. The uh, cytosins 4NH2 group uh, at the fourth position, the NH2 group available. Similarly, for guanine, it is the sixth oxo group and the seventh nitrogen, which is available for, um, you know, accepting electrons or, do or donating electrons or accepting protons or donating protons and the T. You compare it with minor grooves. In the minor groove, you have less number of functional groups that are accessible. So, whether it is the major groove or it is the minor groove, you have functional groups that are accessible and therefore interactions are possible. Now, interesting to note is another phenomenon which is called as bidentate hydrogen bonding. So, say for example, you have a nucleobase or an or a, a, a cyclic compound where uh, consider this is an amino acid residue in a protein and this amino acid residue is forming one hydrogen bond with a nucleobase, then this is a single hydrogen bond. But there are possibilities that a amino acid residue of the protein is forming not one hydrogen bonds but two hydrogen bonds with the nucleobase. So, obviously, when there are two hydrogen bonds formed, this becomes a higher stable, uh, higher stability uh, structure and specificity than with just a single hydrogen bond. So, therefore, that also matters. If you have arginine, arginine can form two hydrogen bonds, say, with a nucleobase. Okay. So, whether it is a bidentate hydrogen bonding or a single hydrogen bonding, even that decides the specificity of the interaction. We all know that the DNA is always having a hydration layer around it and 
some of the water molecules associated with the dna are highly conserved so you will always find a water molecule at that position so many of the interactions that the amino acid residues of the protein make with respect to the base is not directly with the base but through that water molecule so that is also something that has been very clearly observed so if you replace or if you modify the nucleo base in such a way that the water molecule is lost then you will find that the interaction with the protein changes now we understand that it is not just the base readout it is also the shape readout so it goes hand in hand or a base readout and a shape re uh, shape readout together increase the specificity of interaction so this is what we were looking at uh, in the previous this thing when you are looking at the ma major groove the functional groups that are available to interact four against two over here here also you can see three against two so you know that in the ma major group the possibilities of you know interactions are greater so you can have a hydrogen bond acceptor or you can have hydrogen bond donor or if you have a methyl group then you can have non polar interactions you can have electrostatic interactions anything is possible if you have the b dna present as a double helix without any bend a straight b dna then look at the fact how the minor groove and the ma major groove is and you can see the accessible uh, h donor uh, uh, methyl uh, groups or the you know uh, uh, h uh, proton acceptors but when suppose you have the dna bent immediately you look at the fact that the minor and the major groove environments change and so the interactions can change so with a bent dna the interaction will be different and when it is a bent dna then it is called as a global readout so it is reading the shape but it is since it's a bent dna it is called as a global readout suppose you have the bent only at a specific region the orientation of the axis changes only at a very local region then this is what is local readout this is something that we have understood earlier as well now uh one of the examples that hearty sense and snider uh discussed in their uh review paper is uh interaction of uh restriction endonucleases with dna all of us know that type 2 restriction endonucleases specifically cut the dna at specific sites in the dna so the sequence at which it cuts is very specific many of these sequences are palindromic sequences so therefore the restriction endonuclease needs to recognize the sequence bind to the sequence and then cut at the sequence so all these three things have to happen only at the specific sequence so with respect to hin3 what has been observed is that the hin3 has many amino acid residues you can see over here many amino acid residues that directly bind to the nucleo bases and so this nucleo base is the palindromic sequence over here and this binding affinity is establishing a stable conformation or a stable or a very specific interaction they can also interact through the water molecules that are surrounding these nucleo bases but when you look at eco r5 okay eco r5 not just reads the nucleo bases so you can see how aspargin is related to the base pair uh, base pair step present but it is also looking at the kink that has been formed in the dna so this is actually not just looking at the bases so it is it is a base readout but it is also a shape readout you can also observe that with tryptophan repressor binding to the operator region so we all know that tryptophan repressor is again a homodimer okay and within the dimer again you have a very specific super secondary structure which is the helix turn helix so you can see helix turn helix motif you can see the helix turn helix so this is one subunit and this is the other subunit and this two binds to very specific regions in the dna those regions being marked as what is called as the half sites two half sites so that's the operator region which is overlapping with the promoter of the tryptophan operon structural genes so the tryptophan repressor will be able to specifically bind to the two half sites okay and uh, interestingly what has been observed is when the tryptophan repressor binds to the two half sites the dna bends by about 15 degrees and so 
the bending of the dna by 15 degrees is importantly uh, increasing the specificity with which the uh, protein is binding to the uh, dna when you see that there is no interaction of the tryptophan repressor with the two half sides look at the major groove you will see that the major groove has act but when you see that the uh, tryptophan repressor is coming and binding you see that the major groove is getting compressed and see you have the ac but the t is moving so the twist is changing right so this is something that has been observed so there is a structural change that structural change is attributed to the interaction of the base with the helix turn helix of the tryptophan repressor itself so uh, basically what we are trying to look at is that that structure reading and the base reading is equally important with tryptophan repressor binding to the operator region now uh, the shape readout say for example you have certain cases where the shape readout holds a more important recognition feature rather than the base readout so say for example you have a protein that is called as integration host factor and this has been observed to bind to an already bent dna so what it recognizes is a pre bent dna and this pre bent dna may be an a tract so we know that a tract is associated with bent bent dna or you can see that a holiday junction region is associated with the ruv ab complex which is responsible for homologous recombination so it's only ruv a and b that can come and bind to the branch point so this interaction is very highly specific and that is related to the structure of the dna not related directly to the sequence although the sequence is definitely leading to the formation of the structure so you see there is you can you can uh, it's very difficult to delineate the base sequence with the structure of the dna so let us make the conclusions protein binding to dna can be independent of the base sequence with the interaction depending solely on hydrogen bonding electro electrostatic interactions non polar interactions etc the specific binding of the protein to dna is due to a combination of recognizing sequences as well as recognizing shapes of the dna therefore the interactions become more specific due to both the base readout as well as the shape readout interestingly the dna structure is itself influenced by the sequence of the base pairs and therefore both sequence and shape matters in the final interactions there are several higher order structures of dna which are specific binding sites for proteins and within the proteins itself there are domains like for example we saw the helix turn helix domain in the tryptophan rep repressor that can interact with the dna and so you can have proteins belonging to larger families which have certain specific domains so dna protein interactions specific or non specific are being elucidated so you must understand that this is a continuous ongoing process we still do not know a lot about dna protein interactions and with you know protein uh, databases being formed and computational biology becoming a reality now there are lots of uh, uh, proposed structures uh, interactions that have been uh, you know made possible understanding of the interactions made possible because of such computational uh, studies and with advances in technology so that is what i meant there are more and more important structural facets that are being discovered in both the dna and proteins and these chain these confirmations or shapes or sequences in the dna and protein do have biological implications thank you